Today I have with me Mr. Ryan King, the wisdom of kings on Instagram, highly successful businessman and entrepreneur who's going to share with us some of his experiences about that lifestyle and what it takes as a man to make a success of it. Ryan, great to speak with you today. Thanks for taking the time. Hey, thank you. I really, I've really admired you ever since I came across your work. So it's cool for me to be here, man. Well, it's great to have you here. So a lot of guys following me are thinking, what if I get fired like Will did and I have mm -hmm. to provide for my family? And they're thinking about entrepreneurship and it's something I was just thrown into. And I've actually found that I trust the market and my skills more than I trust some employer who can just cut at any moment everything my family is depending on because the atmosphere now is getting so tense and fraught in schools and colleges and universities. People are worried about tripwires all around them. So for me, it's been freeing. Like I can say what I like now, and I've got a thousand bosses rather than just one. Mm -hmm. What have you found about basically masculinity and forging your own way and being your own boss? Well, there's definitely pros and cons. I kind of, um, I kind of ran into a similar. I wouldn't say it's anywhere near the degree that that your situation was, but so uh, I never graduated from college. I was a baseball player, so I went to college for four years. But um, you know, I wasn't really there for school. I was there for baseball. So um, my very first job was in sales, and I was selling uh, cell phones at Verizon, and um, I was just, I, I. I happened to be really good at it you know I, I i didn't know that until i got into it and um and so that was working really well for a while and then um the company that i would the company that i was working for was bought by verizon and uh at that point you know i when i started working in that industry i was a young single guy i didn't have you know bills i was still living at home with my parents and so i was making you know, $70,000 a year. This was right when smartphones and stuff were coming out. So there was a lot of money to be made, you know, converting people from flip phones to smartphones. And, um, and so it was, it was going great. Well, Verizon took over and I was the number one sales rep in the whole company nationwide with Verizon. I had, you know, the target, the target commission was like $2,000 for a sales rep. Well, I had a really good month and my commission was like $10,000. And I was already making 18, 18 or $20 an hour. So, you know, I mean, that's making close to on track to $140,000 a year selling cell phones retail is pretty, pretty darn good for 26 years old, you know? And, um, and so after, after I had that big month, I go and, and our, our commissions are delayed. Uh, by about three weeks. And so I go to check my commission check the day before I'm expecting this $10,000 commission check. And it was $3,000. I said, what's going on? I, I called my boss and he didn't know. And then they just had a word next to it that said windfall minus $7,000. That was all that, that was the only explanation. So I worked my way up the chain. I worked my way up the chain and I finally drafted an email and said, I've been audited. You guys have been all up in my business thinking that I'm lying to people, that I'm cheating, whatever. And um, and basically, I wrote up a draft email and I sent it to the highest up person that I could find, which was the regional VP. There's only four of them in the U.S. And I was by far his best sales rep. I mean, I, I, he had had me go to their stores to train their sales team. You know, like he and I had a relationship. I said, if I don't get an answer on what this means, then I'm I'm blasting this out to, you know, all at Verizon.com. And he said, honestly, between you and me, we just can't let sales reps make that much. It's like, you didn't do anything wrong. I've seen you in action. I know you're the real deal. And so that happened and then my son and i have the same birthday and it's on november 28th and so that a lot of times that falls on black friday and um and so i'd, I'd asked off for my son's first birthday because he was born on my 25th birthday and the, the the week before um they came out and they said everybody's got to work on black friday because it's black friday so I, I missed my son's first birthday party and i had to work every day open to close from black friday through christmas for no reason 
And so, you know, mine wasn't the same situation as yours, but mine was very similar in that, like, I'm not going to miss my son's birthday. I'm not going to have this stuff sprung on me at the last minute. I'm not going to have $7,000 of my commission taken away. And so for me, I was, I didn't really know what, I just kind of reversed it. Right. And so I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurship comes from um, is it's really just like little incremental epiphanies. Um, and you just kind of recognize a certain, a certain thing. And so for me, I started looking at it as well. You know, yeah, I made, I made a $10,000 commission check, but they're only paying me about six weeks worth of what I was making them. If I made the, you know, and most of that stuff stayed on, stayed on for two or three years. Right. So I get six weeks worth and they're getting the other, however many weeks, three years is minus six weeks. Right. If I could figure something out to where I could apply my sales skills into something that I got paid all of it for as long as it was on the books. Then I just quickly did the math and said, man, I could retire by the time I was 35. I just have to. And, and so that, that kind of, it was the first epiphany was, all right, how can I scale and leverage what I'm doing and what my skill set is into something that I'm going to keep making money on, right? So like when I sold, when I sold a cell phone and I upgraded them to a smartphone, you know, that would, that their bill went up by $40 a month, right? For, and I mean, I did that 15 years ago I and mean, they've been making that money this whole time, you know? So I just started looking, I said, okay, what, what can I do that with where I could own it for myself, where I could make, where I could sell something once and keep getting paid on it for as long as they they have it, right? And so I, that kind of sent me down the path of, that gave me at least a vague direction of an idea of what I was looking for. And so when, and I did a couple of different things. I changed jobs every year for three or four years. Because I was like, I'm going to keep finding, I'm going to keep, I, I don't care if the career path is, you know, stick with one company and do this thing or whatever. Like, I don't owe anybody anything. I know what I'm capable of. And so when I finally came across the industry that I'm in now, um, I was working for, I was, uh, I was doing insurance for a little while. And I ran across a couple, some guys that were in the, were starting a payments business. And they said, you know, we think there's a lot of potential here. We've got two clients right now. Um, we think there's a lot of potential here. And so I looked at it and it had those factors. It was like, okay, I can, I can sell something once and I'm going to keep getting paid on it forever. Um, there's, there's very little at the time, especially there was very little competition. Now my competition is like Stripe and PayPal and some of these more well-known names, but you know, 12 years ago, those guys weren't even getting started yet. Right. So, um, but I wouldn't have recognized that opportunity for what it was if I hadn't really thought through, you know, what I learned from Verizon and kind of just flipped everything around. And it really goes back to, you know, just basic critical thinking, you know, like in debate, you have to learn to debate both sides. Right. And it's kind of the same thing. It's like, you got to look at everything from all sides. And that was really what, uh, I don't know that I would have recognized it for the opportunity that it was if I hadn't gone through that thought exercise three or four years before of like, what, what characteristics are I, am I looking for? And so I, I was, I didn't get into the payment space because I care about payments. It's, I, I don't care about payments. It's really boring. It's not interesting. You know, it just, it had the, it had the qualities that I knew I could turn something into. And so for me at that time, um, I, w I was making, you know, I had gone back to Verizon. Well, no, I hadn't. I was, I was actually, uh, I was working for that insurance company. And in order to take the job with these guys that I started with uh, in the payment space, I had to, um, I had a two-year-old at home and a three-month-old son. And this job was going to be straight commission, no benefits, no insurance, no salary, no nothing. And everybody in my life tried to talk me out of it. And I said, this is it. I'm taking my shot. I'll bet on myself. Um, and it was tight for a long time. I mean, for four or five years, it was, I mean, when you look at my lifestyle now, it was very much the opposite of that. I mean, we were, my, my wife had a, had a car that I bought for 1500 bucks at an auction, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was lean. 
Um, but I, but I also had, com I never doubted the fact that it would work either. I just knew if I execute this plan and I keep executing it, then at some point it will, it will be self-sustaining mm. and then I can take my foot off of the gas. Um, and so, you, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You, it sounds like you were always looking to refine. You were curious about how to do things better. You're a mm. smart guy. You observe what was going on around you. You understood the underlying processes and you're looking to build that into something that you can take ownership of. Absolutely. And that's, you know, I think, I think men in general have, have a, I think that's part of why men are very frustrated right now with what's going on with the state of the world as we observe all these things that are going on. And we're like, it shouldn't be that way. It should be this way, right? Like there's a way that it makes the most sense. That's just obvious common sense. And we can't we can't affect that kind of change at a cultural level or you know Hollywood or through the media, but if you start applying if you take that part that the way of viewing the world that a lot of men do, it just comes very easily to a lot of men, um, and start applying it to business, you can find niches, and that's really where you know entrepreneurship comes in is you can find you know, hey this person's doing really well doing this I could make a few tweaks to it. And do something similar and I, and I, and I, and I could make a lot of money. And I think the thing, you know, the thing I think that's misunderstood about entrepreneurship that I, that I, that I talk about a lot is, um, you know, most of what we encounter when you think about entrepreneurship, when you think about starting a business, you know, all, all the dialogue around this topic, it's just like everything. Like we're only exposed to guys like Elon Musk and these these big exits right like if you follow the business pages like if you probably follow entrepreneur on twitter you know or all that stuff they're always talking about going out and getting venture capital and exiting for 150 million and you know and so people think that they've got to have this crazy big idea or whatever right and for a lot of people I never wanted that because I don't want all the hassle that comes along with it. Like I don't have an HR department. I don't have to deal with any of the woke BS, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's me. I've got my, my team of like core of my core team of six and we're all cool. I don't have to worry about HR. I don't have to worry about PC getting sued, any of that stuff. Um, you know, and so that, that would be one of the things I would tell a lot of young men if they were wanting to be entrepreneurs is like, listen, man, like, I'm not a billionaire, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not riding around on yachts, you know, like people think when they think entrepreneur and all that stuff, you know, but I make more than, you know, almost everybody at the hospital other than the brain surgeon, you know, it's a good living, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean? and, you know, and I'm never going to be a billionaire. I'm never going to have a supercar or whatever, but I have come, I have financial freedom. I get to live the life I want, you know, like if I want to, you know, if, if it's a nice day tomorrow and I want to lay by the pool all day on a Thursday, then I will, <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, and, and that's, that's all that, that's about as much as I care to strive for, you know, like I, I, I could work more and make more money to go get a supercar, but at some point the juice just isn't worth the squeeze, you know, like what it requires of me. I don't want a Lamborghini that bad. It's not that I, that I couldn't go get one. It's just a matter of stacking money. You know, it's the same process that got me to where I'm at. I could just keep doing that. But at a certain point, it's like my life really isn't going to change. Like what, what's the, what's the functional meaningful difference in a life between, you know, $750,000 a year and a million dollars a year. Like, not not really that much different like at a certain point you've got a lot of awesome stuff you're you know you get plenty of money in savings like the extra money is it it, it, it stops becoming you know um, providing for your family and it starts becoming just like an ego boost it's like anything else it's, there's no there's no temperance there's no mod moderation you know, mm. you're just chasing money for the sake of it and um, and so that's, that's the advice that I give a lot of entrepreneurs is just like, man, sit down and, and write out like a realistic, perfect life for yourself and draw up the budget for how much that would need to be. And it was, it's probably going to be 400 grand a year or something, you know, like it's not, 
you don't have to go build this crazy tech company and sell it for $30 million. Like you can go build a nice business that's going to generate, you know, four or $500,000 a year in, you know, in revenue and cash flow that you make your own schedule. You do all those things like, yeah, you're not, you know, you're never going to be on the fortune 500 list, but I mean, good grief. You're not going to be complaining either. Yeah. yeah, it's a good way to think about it. So many guys end up just chasing, chasing more and more. And then, like you said, with not wanting to miss your son's birthday, being one of the reasons why you left your first yeah. job, they just wind up creating that situation for themselves again where work dominates family life. Yeah. And that was my thing. And, I, and, I, and I, I've written about this specifically Um on my Instagram page where I, you know, I sit down and I told my wife, like, here's the plan. You know, when I took this job, I said, it's going to be like, I'm not going to have much left for you guys. Like right now, the kids were two and a baby. Like this is mommy time. And and this wouldn't, this wouldn't be popular for me to say on Instagram or whatever, but it's like, there's not much I can contribute as a dad when they're three years old. Like they're not going to remember anything. They just need somebody to sit on the floor and play with play with a puzzle with them. And it's like that's not that's not me. I'm not wired that way. Like for me, this is going to be mommy time. Like you take them to the park, you you take them to have fun. Y'all sit out on the porch and draw draw pictures or whatever. Y'all aren't going to see me much for the next few years because I'm going to be building something. But the pro the promise that I'm going to make to you is that if you'll partner with me in that and not get bitter and not get resentful and not get jealous that you're not getting a whole lot of time for me. I'll more than make up for that down the road because I want to be free when they're in their teenage years, when they need me the most, which is exactly the situation I'm in now where if I, if I need to, you know, if something's going on with my son, I could literally just, we could pack up, go get in the truck and I could take him on a road trip for a week just the two of us and be like, let's get our, let's get our minds right. Let's get our relationship back on track. You know, whatever's going on. Like I have the freedom to do that now, but it took the sacrifice of like, I have no memories of my, of like, like my youngest son that was like three months old when I started working at the business that I ended up buying from the previous owners. Like, I don't really have any memories of him from the time he was, you know, a few months old until about, he was about seven. I mean, it was like a, you know, and in hindsight, I wouldn't do anything differently, you know, because now we've got so much quality time together, you know, and um, I've learned a lot of lessons that I can share with him, you know, mm. and, um, we've got yeah. the financial means to go, you know, do stuff like that. You know, I mean, a couple of months ago, Kurt Storing um was in dallas and i just said hey we're gonna go to dallas and me and the boys hopped in the truck and we spent three days in dallas just the three of us and just went and had a great we went to talk golf and just did guy stuff for three days mm -hmm. and like a tuesday wednesday thursday you know because they homeschool and i can do whatever i want you know and so um it was a sacrifice that i had to make and i think that's what a lot of people um either don't understand and don't don't have the i guess just like the the grit to push through those hard things those sacrifices you have to make on the front end um, yeah and I, and I think part of that is just they don't believe in themselves enough that like to the degree that i did like i i when i took the job i knew i was gonna end up where i'm at where i'm at right now i knew it and, and I never doubted it. And I just, I think a lot of guys don't have, um, just don't have that much belief in themselves. Mm. You, themselves. And you move fast as well. When you were a young guy, you just told your wife, look, I'm going to be retired by the time I'm, what was it, 35? Yeah. And then you didn't dither around for years, um and ahhing ah about taking the steps to make that happen. You had a vision and then committed to it. And then that's exactly what happened, right? It's, I mean, it, it, it is literally like I predicted the future. I mean, the, I mean, I, I called my shot almost word for word 10 years ahead of time. Yeah. But it, that's, that sounds, that sounds arrogant. It's like, 
No, it, it worked out that way because that's exactly what I was aiming at. And I kept iterating on different things until I hit that target, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So and, just, and so. just to recap for people how amazing that is. So we've got a young guy with his wife, kids, and just says, I'm retiring by 35. It's going to be tough, but bear with me. And then you'll see the fruits of it when my family needs me the most because dad's become increasingly important as boys get older and he makes it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think, you know, um, I think every, I think every, I don't know about every guy, but to, a lot more guys than would, would probably realize have that same ability to do. Um, they just, when the, when, when the time comes for them to, you know, pull the trigger, they're just like, I just don't know for sure if I can do it. It's like, well, you're going to, you know, you're, you're it's, then it's not going to work. Like you've got to have an irrational belief in yourself, you know, mm. but based on rational things, you know, yeah. like I, I'd been in sales before, you know, I know I could communicate. I know I was persuasive, like, you know, so it's not like I all of a sudden thought I was, you know, going to be a professional bowler or something that <laughs> I had experience with, you know. Um, but, you know, I, when it comes down to it, there's a lot of men that are super talented at things and they know it, but they, and they get, and they get put in a situation where they have an opportunity that's right in line with their skill set and they still doubt themselves. It's like, bro, why would you doubt yourself? Like, you obviously have the skill to do that. Why would you, well, what if, something comes out of left field and derails it. It's like, dude, you could get T-boned by a car tomorrow and die. Like you can't live your life on maybes. Like mm. if that happens, I'll deal with it then. But the, it, it all comes back to like, what are the odds that that's going to happen? Mm. Like, I mean, yeah, it's, there's a lot of things that are possible, but if it's, a, there's, if there's a 1% chance it's going to happen, Okay, I'm, I'm assuming that's a zero. I'm going to round down. There's a zero percent chance that's going to happen. I'm not going to let that dissuade me. Like, yeah. Know, and if it and if that does happen, then I'll figure it out then. Exactly. It's about knowing what your skills are and trusting that when the opportunity comes along for you to actually show them off, people are going to value them. It's like when I first applied for the job at Eton, people said your family didn't go there. Uh, you don't sound like you are posh enough to work there. Don't even bother replying. And I just said, no, look, ignore that. I'm I'm good at what I do with the teaching. And once they see that, then they'll recognize it. And on the day when I went for the interview, I didn't have a lesson plan. So the head of the department says, what are you going to do today? And I got this poem to discuss with the boys. 17, 18 year olds in their final year, they're right before they go to university. And I said, I've got no lesson plan. We're just going to talk about the poem. And then uh, head of the department laughs. And then I can see the little twinkle in his eyes like, oh, this is this guy knows what he's doing. Let's see if it works. And I was just thinking, just watch. And then they just ask questions. I respond. We get a good conversation going. And it's so much better than if I'd had some neat prissy lesson plan with all the points i'd prepared in advance because i'm responding to exactly what is coming out of the poem for them in the moment and then the lesson goes great and the guy sees that i can just teach on the fly which is the thing that kids want really because it energizes the room and then i get the job yeah. and then same thing happened when i was getting fired as well are you going to be okay what are you going to do next what are you going to look for another job in another school i said no i'm done with schools now after what that school has done to me i'm never working in a school again mm -hmm. again i've got skills there's people who value them i work something out and i noticed some of the comments in interviews people were watching saying this guy seems crazy is he is he like a millionaire he's got money in the bank already he knows he's gonna be okay so, no it's not that is that yeah. i've got skills people have things that they need and i can help to provide them so that's yeah. that but yeah. you've got to have quite thick skin though because you're going to get people saying it can't be done. You're going to come into setbacks. It's going to have tough times as well. Tell me a bit more about the fact that you need a thick skin through what you went through as well. Um, I don't know that I have thick skin. Um, I think mine is more of, I just really don't care. <laughs> 
you know, like, I don't care if you think I'm crazy. Like everybody in my life, my whole life has told me that I'm crazy, you know? And like, I could tell you stories about like calling my shot. I did that with sports. I did it with everything. When I was 10 years old, I would tell my parents, I'm going to do something like you're crazy. I'm like, just all right, watch, you know, because in my head, you know, when you're in your gifting and I don't want to sound arrogant, like 90% of the things in life, I wouldn't be this way about because I don't understand them. I don't get it. Right. And then I always think back to the, it was, it was really profound for me in that, in the movie, Goodwill Hunting. Um, when the, the female, the love interest is asking Matt Damon, you know, like how this work is really hard, you know, and a lot of really smart people have a really hard time doing this. And, but you make it look so easy. And he said, you know, have you ever played the piano? She says, not really. He said, yeah, me neither. You know, but when Beethoven sat down to play it, he just knew how to play. Nobody taught him, you know. Um, and, you know, he's, and he said, I can't hit a ball out of Fenway. I can't compose a symphony. And when it comes to math, I've always just been able to play, you know. And I think for me, um, there, there are a few, there are a few things that for me, I have where my confidence comes from, where my thick skin comes from, where the people say, Oh, you're crazy comes from is that for me, I see all the dominoes in advance. I'm, I know the outcome is an inevitability. Whether you, whether you, you just can't see what I see. If you could see what I see, you would be just as confident as I am. There's nothing that can prevent the outcome, you know? And so it, it's like, it's like chess being able to see eight moves in advance or whatever, you know, like I'm, I knew what was going to happen with this business when I took the job, you know, it was just a matter of putting a plan together to execute. Um, and sure things come up that try to throw you off track, but they're just problems to solve. You know, mm. you know, and so, um, you know, now not everybody's wired that way. You know, I don't, I don't know where that comes from. Um, but that's, that's where mine came from. It was just, a, it was just a simple matter of like, I just, I don't doubt myself, you know, I know what I'm good at. I know where my strengths are. Um, I'm also not delusional, you know, like I don't know anything about automotive, you know, like, so if you, you know, pull the engine, if you pull the hood up on a car, say, Hey, fix the engine. I'm not going to be like, yeah, I got this. I'm going to be like, I'm, we're going to need to hire somebody. I don't understand how this works. You know, but when you, when you put me in the, in, in the areas that are my strengths, I just, it really i don't really care if people think i'm crazy it's just like it's gonna be really fun when you I, like i'm gonna, like let's take a selfie let's take a note and i'll and i'll send this back to you in 10 years <laughs> i do exactly what i said i was gonna do and you're gonna and you're gonna eat crow like it's just like i just i almost think it's funny it's like it's cute that you think that you don't but it's not gonna work like, <laughs> you know. i like the attitude and you said that when stuff comes up it's just problems to solve and people call that like growth mindset don't they you hear that phrase a lot the yeah. obstacles in your way you can find ways around them or if need be through them or it turns out that the obstacle might be something that just makes you refine more and then as a result what you're building gets even better yeah. but some people just get intimidated by obstacles i think i think a lot of that comes from I, it's funny i had i had a strange experience in building my business because for the first three years it was just me and i did everything you know and i got to a point so i was working too much when it came time to start training people i had to replicate myself all of a sudden i had to get really really self-aware and like reverse engineer myself i've just been doing things naturally but trying to teach it to somebody else um man, you talk about challenging having to go through. It's like, in a lot of ways, it felt like trying to describe like, you know, what does, what does green look like to somebody that's blind? You know, it's like, I just, I never learned this anywhere. I just, I show up and I say things and it works, you know, like, I don't know how to teach this to you. Um, but one of the things that I really found as I was going through that self-reflection was I'm very stubborn. And I think, in a lot of ways it's very childlike actually 
Um, you know, because if you take it and you've got kids, anybody that's ever had kids, like if your three-year-old wants something, right? Like if he wants a snack that's too high up in the, in the, in the cabinet, he's going to build some sort of like, he's going to stack a box on top of a whatever. And like, <laughs> he's going to do whatever he has to do to get what he wants. Right. Like he doesn't care about failure. He, you know, he's, he doesn't care. He's, he doesn't, he's not intimidated. He's not worried about any of that stuff. He's just like, I want that. And I'm just not going to stop until I get it, you know? <laughs> and, and, and the more I reflected on myself as, as, a, as a function of having to train people, the more I have this kind of, I would say it's still the theory that I was just too stubborn to grow up, you know, like it just never crossed my mind to be intimidated. It's almost childlike. It's like, no, I want that. You know, I want to retire at 35 because I don't like working. Working sucks. I don't want to do it. So so I'm going to get it over with as fast as I can. (laughs) It's like, so in some ways I think, the school system and the media and, and all that stuff where we're grading everything and everything is evaluated performance evaluations and all this stuff. I feel like it's like we, it, it turns us into zoo animals that forgot how to hunt. Whereas like every little kid, if they want something, they figure out how to get it, you know? And I tell, I tell, I tell every guy, like every man should spend one or two years in, in sales just facing rejection and having to learn how to persuade and having to retool your approach and all the different things that that come up. Um, I think every man would benefit from that. Um, Almost like a necessity, you know, like I think every man should have to do military service at some point, you know, now anymore with the governments being like they are, but you know, in a perfect world, I like the idea of military service and all the skills that that gives you. But at the same time, I think every man should spend some time in sales um, because it just it 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 bleeds over and it, and creates so many skill sets that are helpful in so many other uh, endeavors that you could ever want to do. Um, mm. I mean, there's some there's some wisdom of kings advice right there for guys who don't want to go to college, get into sales early and then learn some important life lessons that you can refine and then apply to whatever you pursue afterwards. And yeah, I mean, you're, and that's the thing. It's like a lot of people like, Oh, I don't want to be in sales. I don't like rejection. You know, I don't want to be the cheesy salesperson or whatever. It's like now that I'm planting this seed of awareness in, in you and whoever's listening, observe your wife, observe your, your kids and observe how often they're selling you stuff. Babe, we need a new dishwasher. And here's why we need the new dishwasher. And if we have the new dishwasher, I'm going to be able to get this much more done and blah, blah, you know, like they don't realize they're selling, but they're selling, you know, when, when your son wants an extra, you know, piece of candy after dinner or whatever, he's, he's coming to you and he's presenting his case. I want this and here's why. And if you let me have this, then I'll do extra chores tomorrow or whatever. It's like, again, it's a zoo animals thing. You know, like I feel like in a lot of cases, adults are are natural gifts and instincts that were there as children are trained out of us as we go through these systems that want us to conform and that punish failure, you know, that, that, um, that punish curiosity and creativity and, um, and a lot of those things. And yeah, I think a lot of, in a lot of ways, these are very childlike things really, you know, um, and sales is one of them. My kids are selling me stuff all the time. They're not good at it, you know, (laughs) but they're trying, you know? Yeah. It's a good message. So you've got this real optimism then that some people think, looks crazy but for you it's just based on your awareness of your own capabilities and an accurate assessment of the situation you're going into which you've selected because it gives you the chance to make those capabilities shine so for the guys looking for what their own skill set is and what kind of niche is the best place to exploit it what kind of advice would you give you seem like a decisive guy You, you look you make your assessment you make your move and that's yeah. tied up with masculine traits in general you don't 
pussyfoot around. You just see the path and you start on your journey. But for guys who might say, but I don't know what my skill set is. And I wouldn't even know how to find the situation that would let me show it either. What would you say? I would say, um, talk to your parents, talk to the people that know you best. Um, because we're blind to our own gifts, right? Like I didn't know I was a good salesman. Um, so many things about myself that there's been a lot of really interesting feedback I've gotten since I got on Instagram about certain aspects of my personality that are unique that to me, I never knew they were unique. I didn't want, I don't know any other way to be until somebody else pointed them out. So a lot of times we're blind to our own gifts because we don't know any difference. So we assume that because it's easy for us, it's easy for everybody. When in reality, you're special, but you have, you have no frame of reference to realize that, to realize that. And so, um, for me, the advice I give people is, you know, go to the people that are closest to you and say, you know, what have you noticed about me that, you know, comes easily to me that you struggle with? You know, what do you feel like my gifts are? What do you feel like my strengths are? What do you, you know, and and really kind of almost interview the people around you to get an, a, a, an outsider's perspective because, I, I truly believe that the things that we're the most gifted at, unless something, unless something crazy happens to force that out, a lot of times we don't realize it's a gift. We're walking around thinking that everybody is like us. When in reality, we might, we might be one of the top 1% in the world at a certain skill, you know, but until, until you realize like, oh, that's hard for other people. Well, that's easy for me, <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's hard to do. And when you're talking about stuff, skills that are like non-physical, like it, look, if you're a fast runner, it's obvious you're faster than other people because you have something to compare to, you know, you watch, you know, an NBA basketball game. It's like that guy can jump a lot higher than the other guy. So it's pretty easy when it comes to certain gifts to be like, Oh, I should probably play basketball. I can jump really high, you know, but, when it comes to a lot of these, you know, non-physical athletic type skills, it's not like we're having a competition and who's better at problem, problem solving, you know, like, you know, I, I know now, man, I'm a problem solver. Like there's no doubt in my mind, you can throw anything at me and I'll figure out a solution for it, you know, but I didn't, I didn't know that about myself. I didn't know. I, I say that I knew that about myself. I didn't know that it, other people had a hard time with it. I thought it was as easy for everybody else as it is for me mm-hmm. until other people started pointing it out. And so that would, that would be my advice. And, you know, and the other thing that I would say is, you know, um, you don't have to be, you need to be self-aware enough to know like, not everybody's wired to be an entrepreneur, right? That doesn't mean that you have to go work for a corporation either. So one of the things that I've talked about is, is, you know, like an entrepreneur has a very, has a, it usually fits a certain mold. You know, they're a risk taker. They're usually charismatic. They're big thinkers. They're visionaries, whatever, right? But like, the flip side of that is that they usually aren't very organized. They don't have a lot of follow through. Um, you know, there, there's, there's two sides to that coin, you know? And so like, I have a guy that works for me um, that he is, he is good at all the things I'm not good at. He compliments me. And so I think a lot of guys, everybody wants to be the alpha, you know, when everybody wants to be the general and, and you know, and, and some guys just aren't wired to be the general. They don't want to be, they want to be the support guy. They want to be the Lieutenant that just goes and executes that they don't want to have to lead. They don't want to have to do all those things. And so um, my advice to guys like that would be like, if you don't feel like you're wired to be an entrepreneur, maybe you just don't have the charisma to be a good salesman. That's okay. Find someone who is and attach yourself to them 
and say, hey, I can help you. You know, have the boldness to go talk to that visionary entrepreneur, outgoing, outspoken type and say, hey, you need me. Here's what I'm going to bring to the table for you. I'm going to watch your back. I'm going to take care of all the dirty work. I'm going to do all the things that you don't want to do. I'm going to make sure the books are straight. I'm going to make sure that the employees are trained. I'm going to take everything you're saying. And I'm going to, you know, like I had, I literally have a guy that when it came time to start training our team, he was like, I want you to sit down and just do what you do. Just talk, just go. I'm going to record it. And I'm going to type it all up into transcripts. I'm going to format it. I'm going to categorize it. I'm going to organize it. And I'm going to turn it into a training program that's now replicatable. Like, I would never have done that. I, and I couldn't do that because my my gift is in the almost improvisation of having a conversation. You know, if you set me down behind a computer to write the training program, everything that's special about what I do wouldn't be in it. Because mm -hmm. that's my mind was in a different place. Right. And so he's been invaluable to me. Right. And I pay him far more. I mean, he, he was working construction, making 30 grand a year, you know, and I probably pay him. I mean, I know I pay him over six figures now, you know, to just be my Lieutenant, you know, you be good at all the things I'm not good at, you know? Um, and I, that that's, that's another piece of advice I would give is like, know yourself, learn your gifts. No, don't try to be something you're not. If you're not wired to be an entrepreneur, that's okay. You know, there's still opportunities for you to attach yourself to somebody that is going somewhere and ride, basically ride their coattails. Yeah. Because nobody is a singular entity of entrepreneurship. Like there's, and, and it goes back to like, even when you talk about gender roles, you know, like there are naturally things that the man is good at and is more inclined to. And there's naturally things that the woman is good at and is more inclined to. And it's, and it's really just about, we talk, it's called gender roles now for, you know, I didn't, I didn't know about it. This whole relationships, gender role space that existed, you know, when me and my wife were going through this 15 years ago, I just called it division of labor. Like, Hey, you're, you're naturally better at these things. So you, you operate in your area of gifting and I'll go operate in my area of gifting and we should be all right. You know? And when you first start out as an entrepreneur, it's like a pie chart, you know, it's like, there's, you know, a hundred things that need to get done in this pie chart. I'm great at like 15% of them and I'm decent at the other 30% of them. And then, you know, the other 55%, I am awful. I mean, I'm the world's worst, you know. But right now, I'm the only employee of the company, so I've got to do all of it. So 15% of the work's great, 30% of the work's decent, and 55% of it's garbage, right? And so the first thing you do is you got to hire somebody that's great at the stuff you're garbage at. And then as you grow, you, you, you want to build this out to where everybody... You have you have the people in place around you that are great at all the areas of that pie chart. And then for me, my job is to spend as much time as possible only doing the things that I'm great at in that small piece of the pie and have other people around me that are great in the rest of the pieces of that pie. So that 100% of the pie is being taken care of by people that are great at it. Right. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities. If you know what you're great at, then you can recognize a business that isn't doing that great at something you're doing and saying, Hey, here's what I'm, and, that, and that's what I would do. If I was in that situation, I would literally go, if I knew a business that needed my help, I would go. And like, if, you know, I've told people before, it's like, Dude, figure out who the CEO of the company is, get on LinkedIn, find their picture, go sit in the lobby of the building that they work in. And when you see them walk in, go get on the elevator with them and they'll give you 30 seconds. You get, you got 30 seconds in the elevator with the CEO to say anything you want to say. Go hit, go shoot your shot. That's what I'd do if I was, if I was desperate and I needed something, that's what I'd do. Like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do something crazy. I'm not going to put, I'm not going to apply online. 
I'm going to put on a suit. I'm going to walk in. I'm going to, I'm going to make it happen. And so what I would tell a, a, a young guy is like, if you know yourself and you know your skills, then it'll be easy to recognize a business that needs you because you'll have an interaction with them or something. And you're like, man, I could really fix that. Then you go, you go in there and say, Hey, I want to come in and I want to, I want you to create a role for me. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. I want you to pay me this as a base and, you know, any, any new revenue or any, any money, any money I save you because of I'm going to increase efficiency or lower costs or any new money I bring into the table to increase the top line revenue, share that with me. Pay, to pay, pay for performance. My commission will be, I'm going to make us more efficient. I'm going to make us more productive. I'm going to make us to where, you know, we're not going to lose money on inventory or, you know, whatever, right? Like there's so many different ways you could go about it. Um, but you can't, you can't know that until you really reflect on yourself and realize what, what your skill set is. Mm. And be, being the guy who gets in the elevator and, makes that pitch also reveals something about you that is evidence of what you're saying about yourself. Like you're committed and you're resourceful and you're the person who gets things done because most people would hear that and think it's crazy. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to just that's wait for him and ambush him in the I'll elevator. Win. That's why I'll win. I like your point about having tight circles of friends or associates as well and making sure that people compliment you because often the pros about ourselves can also be the cons too so if you're the kind of guy who moves fast and is stubborn that's great sometimes but it can also be a bad thing and you yeah. need people around you who aren't like that so they might spot some things that you might miss Mm -hmm. Say a bit more about this. So people feeling like, well, using myself as an example, I didn't know until I took the psychometric test just out of curiosity, but I'm extremely disagreeable, like 99.9% .9 percentile disagreeability. So if you put me in an argument with somebody over something that I think matters and I'm right about, I'll just keep going and going and going and going until it just grinds them down. And then eventually the problem solved. And that's been really useful um, in schools that I've worked in before and has fixed things that no one else was willing to say anything about, but I'm the guy who brings it up. And then finally it gets done and it's no longer festering. But it yeah. can also be a really bad thing because some people don't like having that experience. They feel under personal attack and mm -hmm. you need someone who's a bit softer, who believes in the point at stake and knows it has to happen, but can just tone it down a bit. Otherwise, I'm just like um, like a pit bull that gets a bone or something and it's just never going to stop. I need to yeah. be like, just chill for a bit. We don't need to do that right now. So mm -hmm. I've always had those kind of people in my life. My wife is one of them. And you just have to realize that your strengths can also be your weaknesses, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, and I've said that, I mean, I've yet to be able to come up with anything that doesn't have that effect where every strength has it's a double is a double-edged sword i can't come up with anything that's not there's a there, you know i mean you, you know you can pray too much you can sit and pray until you starve yourself to death and die like there's nothing that if that can't be a that can't also be a bad thing you know these personality traits are neutral it's the situation that you use them in that makes them good or bad you know, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it takes, again, reflect self-reflection, knowing, knowing how you are and having the, the, the wisdom to see people and say, that person would be good for me. You know, they're going to balance me out and having the humility to say that in this one area, you know, just I guess to make the point easier, you know, like I've told my wife and I've told, I've told people that at, at my office, like if, if there are certain situations that we have a safe word or it's just like, if you say bananas, I'm just going to shut up. It's like, 
Like you have veto power over me when it comes to these certain things that I know I'm not good at. You know, a lot of men aren't willing to give that up. You know, a lot of people aren't, aren't, aren't willing to give that up. They have too much pride, you know, but um, all, all of the good, all the upside work that you do can all come crashing down if you don't protect against the downside. And that's, that's basic investment, right? Like you hedge against, you know, you hedge against potential downside risk by doing different things, right? It's, so you can think about it as humility or you can think about it as it gets, as just a hedge against what if me being the way that I am would actually hurt my family or hurt my career or hurt my finances and it, having and and being willing to put boundaries in your life around that you know um like and like for me i'm i'm not good i'm not good with money it's always been too easy for me to make i don't have any respect for it um and so i waste a lot of money you know and so those are things that i've had to do I've, I've, you know where i've put boundaries around access to my own money <laughs> you know because i know that I, it's just never something that I'm going to be. I don't worry about anything. Like I just don't worry about things. Like I don't have, I have very, I very much have like a growth mindset or like a positive mindset. Like it's one of the things that I've, um, I would say one of the lessons I've taught in my, my wife and my employees that I've gotten a lot of feedback on is probably the most helpful thing I've ever, I've ever taught any of them was like, everything's fixable. Like everything. There's no reason for you to be worried about this. Like if you mess up, it's the worst thing that could possibly happen. If that happens, it'll probably still be okay. Everything's fixable. So just take a deep breath. As long as you didn't screw up on purpose, I'm never going to be mad. Whether it's I'm talking to my wife or I'm talking to my kids or I'm talking to my employees. Like I know your heart. I know you're not screwing stuff up on purpose. So relax. Everything's fixable. We'll figure it out. There's, just, there's, there's a solution for everything, you know, but it's not good when I'm like that about money. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can blow this money on nonsense. Everything's fixable. If I get in trouble, I'll just make more money. Like, well, that's not a good way to be. <laughs> you know? And so for me, it's just like, I've literally told, you know, guys that work for me, I've told my wife, it's like, give me a debit card that's got a preset spending limit on it on a monthly basis. That once I'm out, I'm out. And there aren't many business owners that would be willing to do that, you know, but it's like, I know myself. I know that I just, you know, I've tried to care on my own and I just can't. I One of the things is like, I can't lie to myself. I've never been able to lie to myself. I know that I'm just, I know that if I decided I wanted to go make a lot more money tomorrow and if I got in trouble, and I needed to go make a lot of money, I could. And so trying to pretend like I've got this mindset of, you know, having to be frugal. Like, I can't lie to myself. I know I don't have to be. And so the best thing, the, the wisest thing that I can do is to put people in my life around me who don't let me fall into those potential pitfalls. Mm. And just Just give me you know, a set amount on a debit card that I don't have access to and just be done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just about to say, listening to you, you strike me as a sort of person that if you lost everything tomorrow, you get it all back within 10 years. Oh, it wouldn't even take me 10. Yeah. yeah. Especially what I, it took me 10 years the first time because I didn't know what I was doing. Now I know what I'm doing. I mean, it yeah. Take long at all you know yeah now on instagram recently just a final question i want to ask you i noticed that you did something a lot of guys don't do and aren't open about which is just said flat out i'm depressed at the moment yeah i respected that that was good to see because most guys looking at your lifestyle and what you managed to achieve and retiring by 35, et cetera, think what's he got to be depressed about? Um, 
how can a guy who's made it in all the ways that I'm thinking is important uh, be struggling with anything right now? Say a bit more about that experience of depression and then what, what caused it, you think, and what you did about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, it is, it's strange, you know, you spend your whole life um, being underneath authority of some kind, you know, you go from parents to teachers to, to bosses and always having for the most part, this external accountability. And, and um, you know, I, I, what I wasn't expecting when I, when I really made it would be like, um, I wasn't expecting how difficult it would be to not have any external accountability. Like I can go a month and not go, not go into the office once and be fine, you know, and as good as that sounds on paper in reality, it's dangerous, you know, like not having any pressure, <laughs> you know, like, and, um, and I think that contributed a lot to, to the, to the depression was just like, it's like, what, what the hell is my purpose supposed to be now? <laughs> you know, like all the things that, I, all the targets that I aimed at, I've hit. And it's just like, man, what, what am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> you know? And, you know, a lot of people talk about depression as like a lack of purpose or whatever. And it's like, well, what happens when you accomplish all of your purposes? What do you do then? <laughs> you know, it's like you either find a new purpose or whatever, you know, but um, when it comes to, you know, a lot of the stuff like on Instagram or, you know, potentially trying to blow that up or start a podcast or whatever. Um, the timing's not right because I want to be here for my boys. You know, I want to be here for these next few years. And so I'm kind of in a weird spot right now where I've got five or six years where I'm intentionally not really trying to do anything purposeful other than be present with my kids you know and stuff but as as a really high achieving guy it's hard for me to not have anything that i'm really you know chasing as a high achievement you know and and so i didn't that's one thing when i said earlier about seeing you know multiple steps into the future i did that one came completely out of left field for me i was not expecting you know the gut punch of like it's strange waking up not having anything urgent that has to get done. <laughs> you know, it really is. It's, it's a strange feeling and it's first world problems, you know? Um, but yeah, I, you know, as, as far as the, as far as the depression, I think that, I think that plays a part in it. Um, you know, to a degree, I've always struggled with, um, I just really don't, don't care about a lot of things, you know, like when I said earlier about, you know, I see, I know I could go do these things if I wanted to in a lot of ways. It's like, why watch the movie if you know how it's going to end? So I end up just not doing, there's a lot of things I just don't do because it's like, I know if I decide I want to do that, I'll be great at it, <laughs> you know, and that kind of ruins the fun of it when you know that it's going to work that way. Um, and so I, I go through ups and downs with, with, uh, with that. And I've gotten a lot better. I think I posted that back in January. Um, it's not a permanent thing where I lay around and feel, you know, I don't wallow in it. You know, it's not that I, it, it, you know, I think I wrote in that post, you know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not sad. I'm not like crying or anything. I just like, I just really can't, I can't feel anything. I just don't care you know like nothing's exciting i'm not looking forward i don't have anything i'm looking forward to and I, i'm not having anything i'm excited about going to the gym just feels like a grind you know it's just kind of like i just feel like i'm just going through the motions you know and um but i've all, i've been through that before and i know that it's temporary you know and i and i in particular i wanted to i wanted to point that out for the reasons that you mentioned you know it's like you know guys it's it's strange on Instagram to get feedback on how you're being perceived by other people. Uh, I'm sure that's happened to you too. It's just like, man, the way you see me is like, I mean, it's it's true, but it's very 
narrow. There's a lot more to me than, than, you know, what I could ever portray on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of, I think it, you know, people look at the externals of, of my, of my life and think, Oh gosh, he doesn't deal with any of the things that I deal with, you know? And it's like, man, I do. I'm just as human as you are, man. And, um, and I think that's important for young men to see, you know, um, that it's okay to not yeah. always feel awesome, you know, and, um, you know, for me, it's just, I've been through it and, and, and I know, I know that it's temporary, you know, and, and so it's just one of those things where like the biggest thing that I'm working on in my life right now is just like, tell yourself, no. You know, just for the sake of it, like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave the gym early, you know, tell yourself, no, like, I'm not going to, you know, buy the, whatever new thing that I want to buy, you know, I mean, just, even though I can afford it and that's, and that's what's, that's what makes it hard. It's like, there's no consequences for me, you know, like I could buy it and it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, but I'm just really working that no muscle. Of like, no, I'm gonna wake up. You know, like I could sleep until noon every day, and there's literally nothing would happen. There'd be no consequences for it, you know. Um, and so, yeah, for me, it's just I'm working on telling myself no. I'm working on just waking up and and executing. And really, for the first time in my life, it's like I'm learning how to try to be present in the moment, you know. And it's just like, you know, I really like last week. Like the highlight of my week is I really enjoyed mowing my yard. You know, I've got 15 acres and it's beautiful. And um, I just spent the whole day, just not, not the whole day, but four hours just on my mower, just soaking up, you know, this surreal idea that, you know, in a lot of ways, I still feel like a 25 year old kid. that's like, oh shit, I've got a baby that I got to take care of. Like, what am I going to do? You know? And now I look back and it's like, I just remember looking around at the land all day while I was mowing it, just, just really soaking up the idea of like, man, you did it, you know, got great kids. I mean, look at the house that you have, like, good for you, man. You know, and it was just kind of one of those moments where I just really sat back and just appreciated what I had and, and just enjoyed mowing the grass, you know, and, um, and things like that are how, I, you know, for me, or how, how it helps me get out of those depressive states, just getting up and put one, you know, putting one foot in front of the other. And um, I think the most, the most important thing I would tell anybody that's going through depression is, is while you're in it, it feels like you're never going to get out, um, but you will, mm. you just gotta, you just got to wake up and and sometimes it's like, mentally you've got to you've got to claw your way across the floor with your fingernails like it's like a, it's all yeah. you can do just to get out of bed and do the yeah. basics you know yeah um, but if you do that it'll get better that's it so some people were asking me when i got sacked and lost my house and all the rest of it and they tried to ban me from teaching the life uh, did you go to the doctor and get pills and anything like that I was, no I got a bit depressed about it, but I knew that just take one day at a time and just keep going to the gym, just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And then eventually it'll all pass and I'll be somewhere better. Yeah. And then just cultivate gratitude as well. I love that story of the millionaire mowing his lawn and that being the highlight of his week, just thinking, yeah. what a great life. Appreciate yeah. the basics. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. It was just like, a, it, in some ways I was, it's funny because it's like, man, the 15 year old version of me would be so disappointed with myself that I'm enjoying mowing the lawn, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, um, but yeah, you know, and, and in the past I wouldn't have enjoyed it. I would have been annoyed by it. Right. It's just like another thing to do another thing to, you know, I don't want to be doing this, um, you know, and so it's just a cut, man. I'm, I'm always growing. I'm still growing. I'm growing more now than I was when I was building my business, you know, like life has these different seasons where, 
you know, like I felt way better about myself towards the end of building the business than I do now, actually. Because, man, I was right in the middle of operating in my gifts and I was tearing it up and I was getting results and, you know, money was popping and I was training people. And, man, I was just I was just tearing it up, you know, and, and now I'm in a totally different season of life. And it's a to it's a completely new. Mental, emotional, you know challenge of adjusting to not having a boss and not having urgency and mm. you know, having to completely relearn how to be you know like i i never had to be present in the moment i couldn't be present in the moment i had to be in my head it's like i've got three sales presentations tomorrow i've got to be prepped i've got to be ready i've got to be doing all this and whereas now it's like you know it's a real challenge for me to go mow the lawn and just all right i'm going to be present in this moment the whole time I'm mowing the lawn, I'm not going to think about any problems to solve and I'm not going to get upset about anything or whatever. I'm just going to smile. And, you know, I don't know that I've ever had a time in my life where I could just look around, take a deep breath and just be in the moment. And so I think there's, you know, I, I think anytime I think, see, you know, you mentioned when you were depressed, it was right after you, you got sacked from your job you know it's like that's a that's a change of seasons i think i think when seasons change and your your routines get you know upset you know and all of a sudden you're having to make all these adjustments and all these changes are happening i think it's very normal to go through you know kind of a a gut punch sort of situation you just and i and i, and I tell men it's like man it, you're not you're not not masculine because you got knocked on your ass. Like <laughs> we all get knocked on our ass sometimes, man. You know, anybody that pretends like they haven't is just lying, or it just hasn't happened yet. But you will. Yeah, that's it, and it's what you do next mm -hmm. that counts. Is about being able to adapt. This has been really interesting. Thanks so much for all your insights and your honesty as well. Yeah, not a lot of people willing to talk about what you just told us, but I really appreciate it. And yeah. for people who've benefited from listening to Ryan, check out the wisdom of Kings on Instagram. Lots of great content there and plenty of life lessons that we could add to these ones. Thanks so much, Ryan. Really good to talk to you. You too, brother. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And take care. Go and mow that lawn. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> Talk soon. <laughs> See ya. All right. All right. Bye.